Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Luxury Reality. Today I'm going to be talking about the Steinhardt Ocean One GMT with the Coke bezel. So the Steinhardt Ocean One GMT. Now let's get the obvious thing out of the way. Yes, this is an homage to a Rolex 16710 Coke GMT. I will get into that during this review, but a little bit closer to the end. But as always, I wanna start out with a bit of history about the brand. Now I did actually reach out to Steinhardt to see if they could give me like a press kit or a little bit more information on, uh, on how they started. Um, but unfortunately they didn't get back to me at the time of recording this video. So I'm gonna have to go with the only source I could find, which was actually uh, Naman Watches, which um, essentially laid it out like this, that Steinhardt was founded in 2001 by Gunther Steinhardt in Bavaria. Now they are still based in Bavaria, their offices are there, but the movements for the watches themselves though are still made in Switzerland and they are primarily ETA movements. In the case of this, we're talking an ETA 2893-2, which is the GMT variant of the ETA 2892. So that's about as much history as I could get for the company as such. Uh, what I would like to do is go through a bit of their model range. Obviously they're known for their homages to Rolexes, so I'll highlight a few of their current homage models as well as some of their original models and some of their evolutions. So you know, watches that you can definitely tell they took inspiration, but Steinhardt has taken a little bit more creative license in terms of developing the watch further. So Steinhardt essentially has an answer for every mainstream Rolex sports watch. Um, so obviously for the Daytona, they have their Ocean Vintage Chronograph. Of course, for the GMT, they have this, which is the Ocean One GMT. And they also have a ceramic variant, which is a little bit more similar to the current GMT Master II that Rolex, uh, that Rolex sells with the ceramic bezel. For the Submariner, they have their Ocean One. They also do an Ocean One Vintage, which is similar to a, um, to a 50s or 60s Submariner. They do also offer a few original models that are clearly original designs that they've made themselves. Uh, things like the Ocean 2, for example, that's a little bit more original. With something like a dive watch, you know, there are obviously always going to be limits and overtones of historic dive watches because between the ISO requirements and just years of history and being used to it, sometimes there's only so much creativity you can do. They also have the Apollon Automatic, which looking at it, I couldn't really see any other sort of watch or homage in it. If you know something that looks like this, please let me know in the comments. But as far as I can tell, it's an original design. And then the last one I want to highlight, and this is the idea that I like the most, and I'll elaborate more after the review about sort of where I'd like to see homage watches go, is the, um, is the Ocean One 500 Titanium. This one, they've made it in titanium. It still has a ceramic Batman style bezel, so black and blue but with different hands, they've got an open case back. You can tell they've taken more creative liberties in terms of evolving what they had originally had as an homage. And I think the end result is something that is a bit more original. And they've done things that you know Rolex wouldn't do. You know, Rolex isn't gonna make a titanium watch anytime soon. So I like that they took that initiative. And that's something that I'd, I would like to see more from watches that are known for making homages, is to take a few more risks that the original doesn't do. But enough about that. Today we're going to be talking about the Ocean One GMT, so let's get into it. And here we have the Ocean One GMT, the reference 103836. It's a 42 millimeter case, and we've got 22 millimeter at the lugs. It is a normal case, not a super case style. And then in terms of thickness, we're talking 13 millimeters. So nice and thin, easy to fit a shirt or jacket cuff over. Now this is obviously a GMT watch. And the movement on the inside is the ETA 2893-2. And the good thing about Steinhardt is they don't rename it. They don't say it's their caliber. You know, they're very open to the fact that it is an ETA. And that particular movement is actually based on the 2892, which is uh, used in a lot of Cartiers and Panerais and Tags before some of those started moving in-house. Now, as we unscrew the screw-down crown and we set it to the first position, you move it downwards for the date. Sometimes it can be a bit frustrating when you get those confused because you have to reset the date all over again. 
But then once you get that right and you remember, then you move it upwards to actually move the GMT hand. So this functions differently to GMT master, for example, where the jumping hour is actually on your home time hand, which is the main hand. So once you've got your GMT hand set where you want it to be, pull the crown out all the way and now you've hacked the balance and now you can set all four hands together so you can get a precise and accurate time. Then once you've got the time set, you just screw in the crown and your watch is back to being 300 meters water resistant. And that is 300 meters water resistant, not the 150 that the GMT Master 2 has. And that's sort of where the improvements over, especially the 16710, that's where the improvements start. So the fact that it is a lot more water resistant, it has a much more solid bracelet. They're all solid links, solid end links. You've got screw in links as well for sizing and you've got micro adjustments. So little details like that, that all contribute to making it feel like a much more modern watch. The bezel itself, it is unfortunately 120 clicks and it's unidirectional. That is something where you can see that they sort of cut costs by using the same bezel action as their dive watch. Um, a GMT bezel should of course be 24 or 48 clicks and bi-directional. Now it's a sapphire crystal as well, supposedly with AR coating, but you can probably see a few reflections depending on the angles. And it does have applied indices and of course super luminova so it can glow in the dark. So barring a few weird angles, it's definitely a very easy to read watch and that comes from the DNA of it being related to a dive watch. Bringing things back to the case, as I mentioned before, it's got 22 millimeter lugs, but it still has nice straight lugs. So it gets that super case presence, but without actually having to widen the lugs themselves. Instead, what they've done is they've widened the space in between the lugs. So it still looks modern, but when you put it on a strap or a NATO, it still gets that nice sleek look of a vintage watch. Now let's move on to my likes and dislikes for this watch. Now the first thing I like about this watch are the improvements that it makes over the Rolex 16710 from the 80s and 90s that it was originally based on. So that starts with the bracelet. You know, you've got the screwed in links, you've got solid end links, and a solid bracelet. Those older bracelets sometimes can feel a little bit sort of shaky. This feels like, you know, a modern piece of engineering. And that really gives you confidence in the watch itself. On top of that, as I mentioned before, it has 300 meter water resistance and you don't really need to feel like you have to baby it. And of course, as you would know from when I uh, reviewed my tutor, I don't like blank case backs. So they didn't give us an open case back, but that's fine. It's not really a great movement to look at, but they gave us a nice little design and decoration. And I think that's a great way to improve upon what Rolex does. The second thing I like about it is its versatility. So you can put it on a NATO strap, you can put it on a leather strap, you can wear it as a dress watch or you can wear it as a tool watch. You can go swimming with it. It's just a very versatile watch and I love that. And the last thing I like about it is the value. As I said before, it feels solidly built. It has a good movement on the inside. And on top of that, and this was the main reason why I bought this watch, is it has that GMT complication. Having that fourth hand there to see a second time zone is great. And when you factor that into the price of it, it is a lot of watch for your money. Now, however, though, we unfortunately have to move on to the dislikes. So everything has its balance. And the first thing I dislike about it are those signs of cost cutting. I know it's a cheaper watch, but still, details like the bezel. They should have made it a proper bi-directional bezel. It's a GMT watch. It should be a proper GMT bezel, regardless of what material it is. The next thing is that the indices themselves, while they are applied, they're also, they, there's something to do with either their shine or their lack of shine. I can't quite articulate it, but they just seem cheaper. And that's comparing them to my Omega and my Tudor, which obviously are more expensive watches, but also comparing that to the white gold that's in Rolex these days. So it's an unfair comparison, but it's a reality. And if it looks cheap, that's a sign of cost cutting no one actually ever wants to see. And then the last thing where you notice the cost cutting is the clasp. Now I praised the bracelet on this, but the clasp feels so cheap. It looks like a product of the 80s. And I know that that clamshell cover, it's gonna, it's gonna wear down. So then it'll start flapping and opening easily. The same thing goes for the friction lock on the clasp itself. And then these swing arms, 
again, they just look and feel cheap. It's like they put all the effort into making the bracelet have some weight to it. And then they just said, oh, let's just put a $2 clasp on it and call it a day. The next thing I don't like is the crown. I don't know if this is just my watch particularly or if it's the movement, but the winding action, it just feels very tinny. And then when it comes to screwing down the crown again and threading it in, sometimes it misses the threads. And you can see even just in its construction, it just looks sort of cheaply done and it ends up feeling cheap when you screw it in and screw it out. So that does kind of slip into the first part where you do sort of notice where they cut costs. Now the last thing that I don't like about this, and it's not actually a problem with the watch itself, instead it's the missed opportunities they didn't take with the watch. So they could have gotten rid of the Cyclops to make it more original. They could have put better AR coating on it. As you can see, on a lot of angles, it just looks like it's got sort of a white film on it if it's reflecting something white. And probably throughout this video, you've seen quite a few reflections of my face or of my camera. And those are things you don't want to see. You want, this, you want the Sapphire to be able to just disappear. So that's a missed opportunity. Even though Rolex doesn't use any AR coating, they could have used better AR coating. And then with the bezel, they could have made a ceramic Coke bezel. Rolex hasn't even made one yet. So I feel like that's a missed opportunity. And I'm sure that they have the technical capacity to do it, especially since they already have their own ceramic black and blue bezel so but at the end of the day all of these positives and negatives do balance out because it's a great all-rounder it doesn't punch above its weight it does exactly what it says it's going to do so that's the steinhardt ocean one gmt now before i get into um touching a little bit more on the topic of homage watches and what i think about them first off i'd like to give you guys a bit of background on my experience in actually owning this watch and buying it purchasing it was very straightforward i purchased it directly from them on their website uh, it currently retails for about 550 US dollars. My oldest brother lives in Germany, so I actually ordered it to him and then um, and then picked it up for him the, from him the next time I saw it. So in terms of delivery and pickup, there wasn't really much for me to tell. And there weren't really any hiccups in the order, so I just had a few confirmation emails from them. It was probably all automated. So not really much opportunity for customer service, but at the same time, not much necessity for it either. Everything went super smooth. Um, and there were no issues, so I can't really complain when it comes to the buying experience. In terms of ownership, one thing I really like about it, and I think it's very important, is every collection should have, you know, what they call a beater watch. A watch that you can wear whenever, wherever, you don't have to baby it, you don't have to worry about, oh, is it gonna get scratched, is it gonna affect the resale value, oh, you know, is it gonna cost me a ton of money to fix it? A watch that you can just put on and just not care what happens to it. That being said, with my other watches, I still wear them anyway and I try my best not to baby them, but I know that inherently I care less about if a scratch happens on this than if a scratch happens on my Tudor or my Omega, for example. It's just the nature of the price point, and it's good knowing that you can have something solid that'll still hold up to it. Wearing this, I have no reason to think that it's not going to hold up to any amount of punishment. And so far in my few months of owning it, it's been perfectly fine. You know, it's, it's a watch that I'm happy to play around with different straps, different, different looks for it. Yeah, you know, it is styled to look like a Rolex. It gives me more incentive to un-Rolexify it. I'm sure that's not a word, but you get the idea. Like for example, this, I'll actually usually be wearing it on a leather strap. As I mentioned in the, in the in-depth section of the review, with 22 millimeters in between the lugs, it still gives it that nice thin lug profile. So when you put it on a strap, or especially when you put it on a NATO, it looks really sleek and that's something I really like about it. In terms of ownership, it's good. I haven't had too many people say, oh, you know, nice Rolex, anything like that. But the reality is that if someone does say that to me, I'd tell them, oh no, it's a Steinhardt, you know, it's an homage to an 80s model because that's the truth. You know, I think it's very important not to false flag or be embarrassed. If you bought this watch, wear it with pride. Just make sure that you bought it for the right reasons. And that takes us into the debate about homage watches. Now I'm just gonna make this short because I would like to make a more in-depth video about it and I'd love to see some of your comments on it as well. Incorporate that into the video to look at different sides of the argument. As an owner of an homage watch, I'm in favor of them in general, but I think there's also levels to it. I think that I look at homage watches in a very similar way that I look to sampling in hip hop. You take something old and you make it better not you take something old and you make it the same. So I guess 
I see the difference as sampling versus a cover. A cover, you're taking something, doing exactly the same, just you're the one singing it. Whereas with a sample, the idea is that you want to chop it up, switch it around, change things and make it better or different from the original. In that sense, I think this does meet that criteria in terms of they have made changes, they have improved it over the original in certain aspects. And for that reason, I do like it. I do think it's different enough. Also, I think a lot of it depends on your motivations for getting for getting the watch. If you're getting it so that people think you have a Rolex, you're already as bad as people who buy fakes. But if you're getting it because, A, first and foremost, you like the watch on its own merits. That's why I tried my best to, uh, to separate that homage factor during the majority of this review, because I honestly think the watch on its own is actually quite good. It represents a good value proposition. It's well built, has a good movement in it, has a great complication that's super useful, especially for people like me that I have to always be monitoring another time zone. And I see no reason as to why it isn't worth its price. I would happily pay what I did pay and that's why I did. The other reason I got it was that I do love the 16710, but I just can't afford it yet. So this was an easy gateway for me to try it on, see if I like the look of it, while still having a watch that met my other criteria of having a beater watch. If I bought this and I didn't like it, I would have just sold it. And I would have been fine, case closed on you know a Coke bezel GMT. But this is a way for me to try it out, see if I enjoy the look over a few years while I save for the Rolex. So it's a nice transition. Now, there are some areas, like I said, where I would like to see more improvement. And this is sort of where I'd like to see some of these uh, watch brands that are known for making homage watches. So I'd like to see them be more extrovert especially when you're talking about an homage to a company like, like Rolex. Rolex is quite conservative in terms of what they do. You know, everyone goes crazy for the Hulk because that was about as crazy as Rolex gets. They made a green bezel and a green dial. It may sound sarcastic when I say it, but when you put it into perspective, that's not very outgoing. And that's fine, that's Rolex, that's their, that's their thing. And that's one of the reasons why when they do something crazy, it gets so much hype. With brands like this, this is an opportunity for them to do what Rolex is either too scared to do or simply doesn't want to do, you know? That's why I keep going back to that titanium watch. Rolex isn't gonna make a watch in titanium. They let Tudor do it, but Rolex isn't gonna make one anytime soon. So that's an opportunity. Use materials that the original wasn't, a, wasn't willing to do. Put features on it that the original wasn't willing to do. Because then I feel the end result is that the company's like Steinhardt are gonna end up with something original, something new. And that's really what I'd like to see. So I do hope that companies like Steinhardt keep working in that and keep working in that direction. Cause I don't think there's any shame in starting in that. Don't write it off just because it's an homage. Look at things like A, how does the watch stand on its own two feet? B, have they changed or improved upon the original? And C, what is the person's motivation for actually having that watch? I feel if you hit those the right way, then there's nothing wrong with an homage watch. But in any case, I'd love to know what you guys think in the comments below. And if you like this video, please do like it. And of course, please do subscribe to the channel so that you can get updates on when I'm releasing new videos. So far, I've been at this for just over a month and been pretty consistent in doing one video per week. So I'd really like to keep that up, maybe even bring it up to two. But for that, I need your support. I need your subscriptions and your comments as well. In any case, thanks again for watching another episode of Luxuryality.